Summary of the Female Persuasion by Meg Wallitzer Greer Kadetsky is a student at Ryland College in Southern Connecticut in October 2006. Ryland College is a small, undistinguished school. She has been at school for seven weeks and has had a terrible time so far. She is jealous of her boyfriend, Corey Pinto, who is at the much more famous Princeton University, and she hasn't been able to make any friends at Ryland. Greer goes to a fraternity party one night. Greer talks to one of the fraternity boys, Darren Tinsler, but when he makes a sexual move, Greer turns him down and Tinsler gets angry. Greer learns that Darren Tinsler has abused at least six other women over the course of a few weeks. When he attacks another woman, the university holds a disciplinary hearing. Tinsler only gets a slap on the wrist, and Greer wants to stand up for what's right, but the other girls are ready to move on and don't want to think about how unfair the situation was. One night, Greer's friend Z. Eisenstadt asks her to go to a college lecture with her. Z's hero, the feminist writer and leader Faith Frank, is making a speech that everyone is looking forward to. Greer comes along, and Faith draws her attention right away. After the lesson, Greer goes to the bathroom with Faith and starts talking to her. Faith is friendly and open, and she tells Greer to keep her head down and study. Z also has a short conversation with Faith, but even though Z is Faith's biggest fan, Faith only gives her business card to Greer before leaving the bathroom. Greer takes a bus to New York City for a job interview at Bloomer, a feminist magazine run by Faith Frank. But when she gets to the office, she finds out that the magazine is going out of business. That night, Greer sends Faith an email thanks her for all the hard work she has done for all women. Corey, who just got a nice consulting job, finds out that he will be working in the company's office in Manila, not in New York as he had thought. One night, Faith Frank sends Greer an email thanking her for the note she sent a few months ago and giving her the chance to interview for a job at her new venture. A few days later, at the interview, Faith tells Greer that she is working with the famous venture capitalist Emmett Schrader to start a women's foundation. This foundation will bring together speakers and groups from all over the country to talk about some of the most important problems facing feminism today. She gives Greer a job at the company, which he gladly takes. Z gives Greer a letter to give to Faith soon after. It talks about Z's wish to work at Loci, the new organization. Greer isn't sure if she wants to work with Z, even though Z is excited about the idea. Greer isn't too happy with how boring her job is at Loci, but she's excited to spend as much time as she can with the attractive Faith Frank. Greer tells Faith about the letter from Z and why he doesn't want to give it to Faith. Faith says that it's all up to Greer in the end. Greer tells a lie to Z the next time he sees her. He says that even though Faith read the letter, there are no jobs open at Loci. Corey is coming back from the Philippines because someone in his family died. Corey's little brother Albie was killed when his mother, Benedetta, pulled out of the garage and hit him with the car. Albie was dead because he was on his stomach in the yard, looking at his pet turtle, Slowy. Shortly after Albie's funeral, Corey's father goes back to Portugal, leaving Corey to take care of his mother, who is still sad. As Benedetta gets closer and closer to going crazy, Corey sees he has to quit his job, stay home with his mother, and clean houses like she does. He tries out some dangerous drugs, but in the end, he'd rather play his brother's old video games than get high. Z wants to leave her small town and boring job as a paralegal, so she gets a job with Teach and Reach, a group that puts young college graduates as teachers in public schools with a lot of troubled kids. Z goes to Chicago and starts teaching, but she has trouble connecting with her kids because their problems are much bigger than she thought. Z is attracted to Noelle Williams, a beautiful guidance counselor at the school, but Noelle is cold to her. Shara Pick, one of Z's children, asks to go to the bathroom one afternoon but doesn't come back. Shara is in a lot of pain when Z finds her on the floor of the bathroom. Soon, it's clear that Shara is pregnant and about to give birth. Shara gives birth to her baby in the nurse's office. After the scary event is over, Noelle and Z go out to dinner to relax. During their meal, 
Noelle tells Z that she doesn't like fake advocates like him who think they can just show up in poor neighborhoods and change things. Both women say they like each other, and at the end of the night, they walk home together. One night, Faith Frank thinks about the things that have happened in her life and how they have led her to where she is now. Faith was born and raised in Brooklyn, but her parents kept her safe because they were very religious. As she went through college, she learned more about society and politics. After she graduated, she and her friend Annie moved to Las Vegas to work as cocktail waiters and travel the world. Faith explored her sexuality and slept with many men, but most of the relationships were disappointing, except for a short fling she had with a guy she worked with at a blackjack table. Annie got pregnant while she was in Las Vegas, and she had to go through a sketchy process in an unknown building. Later that night, Faith took her friend Annie to the ER. When she saw how the nurses and doctors judged and hurt Annie, she was shocked and appalled. Faith soon moved to New York and got active with a women's rights group. Using Annie's story as a point of reference, she focused her politics on getting abortion laws changed for women. Annie got mad when she found out that Faith had told her women's group about her story. She soon moved to the Midwest, got married to a lawyer, and finally became a senator who is very religious and supports life. Faith and a few of her friends also started a magazine for women called Bloomer. Faith and her editors were having trouble getting ads, so they met with three Nabisco execs. One of them knew Faith from Las Vegas, where he and Faith had chatted at a blackjack table. Emmett Schrader, an executive at Nabisco, offered to take Faith out to dinner, but their meeting turned into a sexual encounter very quickly. The next morning, Emmett called Faith to tell her that his wife had found out about the affair and that he would not be buying an ad in Faith's magazine. Emmett did not help the magazine grow, but it did, and Faith became known as a writer, public speaker, and hero for women. Nearly 40 years later, after Bloomer went out of business, Faith got a call from Emmett. He wanted to help Faith start a new business, a women's group called Loci, and would pay for it if she led it. Now, Faith thinks about how she can pass on to the next generation the success, desire, and knowledge she has gained over the years. She chooses to give the keynote speech at the next meeting to Greer Kadetsky. Greer and Lupe Azurieta, a young woman from Ecuador, both get ready to give speeches at the meeting. Lupe was once a victim of sex trafficking. She was saved by an effort supported by Loci and put in a mentoring program supported by Loci. Greer can't wait to tell Lupe's story, but Lupe is scared, sensitive, and upset. Greer praises the training program, and Lupe talks about how much it has helped her. The speech goes off without a hitch, and both Greer and Lupe get a big round of applause from the crowd. Back in New York, Greer meets with Kim, who used to work for Emmett Schrader's venture capital company, Schrader Capital, which gives loci money. Kim says that the loci training program never got off the ground, and that Schrader Capital kept taking money that was meant for the program because they didn't want a PR problem. Greer is shocked by the news and goes straight to talk to Faith. Faith is calm but says she didn't know about the lie. She is horrified by the lies and failure at Schrader Capital but she tells Greer that she plans to move on as if nothing has happened. Greer is surprised, but Faith tells her that it's part of her job to make compromises. Greer leaves his job soon after this disturbing talk. Faith tells Greer that she is a hypocrite because she is leaving because she cares too much about women to work for a shady group, but she didn't stand up for her friend Z when it counted. Greer goes to see Z who is now a well-known traumatologist who lives with Noelle in Chicago and works there. When Greer tells Z the huge lie she told her friend years ago, Z is very upset and the visit has to end. Greer goes back to her city to spend some time with her family and friends before looking for work again. Greer still doesn't like that Corey chose to stay in his hometown, but Greer's mother thinks that Corey, who has spent his whole life helping his grieving mother, is a big feminist. Corey gets a chance to meet with an angel investor and talk about his idea for a game called Soulfinder. In Soulfinder, players search the world for a lost loved one, but grief makes it hard for them to finish their task and beat the game. 
The backer likes Corey's idea and invites him to New York to see a piece of interactive theater that might help him make games. Corey spends the weekend on Greer's sofa bed, but there is friction between them because they don't know each other very well anymore. A few years later, Greer goes to a fancy publishing party to enjoy the fact that her feminist book, Outside Voices, has been on the top list for over a year. Greer is now 31 years old and has a girl named Amelia with her husband Corey. Greer has everything she's ever wanted, a life with Corey in Brooklyn, a stage to talk about women's rights, and even adoring fans. Her daughter's babysitter, Kay Chung, is a radical feminist teenager who is very smart and looks up to Greer a lot. Greer and Corey come home from the party and put their daughter to bed. As Greer thinks quietly about what power is and how it works, she realizes that someone will one day replace her, just as she replaced her best friend Faith Frank. Greer thinks that Slowy the Turtle might outlive her and her friends someday because she and her friends are always fighting for power, agency, and a platform. About the author Meg Wallitzer was born and raised in the New York City of Brooklyn. Hilma Wallitzer, her mother, was a writer and Morton Wallitzer, her father, was a psychologist. Meg went to Smith College and Brown University, both on the East Coast, to study creative writing. Sleepwalking was her first book, which she wrote while she was still in college. Sleepwalking, which came out in 1982, was the start of Wallitzer's writing career. Since then, she has focused on digging deep into the thoughts and lives of women. This Is Your Life, which Wallitzer wrote in 1988, was turned into a movie in 1992 by her master and friend, the famous writer and director Nora Ephron. The Wife, a best-selling book by Meg Wallitzer that came out in 2003, was also made into a movie in 2017 that starred Glenn Close. Wallitzer lives in New York City and teaches in the State University of New York's MFA program for creative writing at Stony Brook, Southampton. She has taught creative writing at conferences, camps, and colleges such as the University of Iowa and Skidmore College. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.